Hello and welcome to everyone. My name is Deanna Horton and I am a distinguished fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. And it's my honor to be here today to be your very moderate moderator. In 2021, I was involved in a discussion with the Asia Society Policy Institute and the Perth USA Centre in Australia about trade coercion, resulting in a policy paper co-authored by trade experts from North America, the EU and Asia. Since that time, the concepts of economic security and economic slash trade coercion have become part of the international lexicon. Last year, I participated in a similar exercise led by the Institute of Geoeconomics in Tokyo, which contributed to the G7 summit in Japan. The Japanese have taken a leadership role in this. Here is a relevant passage from the G7 leader statement. We express serious concern over economic coercion and call on all countries to refrain from its use, which not only undermines the functioning of and trust in the multilateral trade system, but also infringes upon the international order centered on respect for sovereignty and the rule of law, and ultimately undermines global security and stability. The point, though, is that coercion is a superpower weapon, and the USA is as guilty of it as China. For any country that relies on superpower markets, the threat of trade weaponization and bullying is always there. Trade-dependent economies need to stick together, and those larger among us need to help others. Witness Japan's purchase of freedom pineapples from Taiwan when its exports to China were blocked. I am now going to turn it over to my three panelists to give their insight. First, Ambassador Skusevicius of Lithuania, Hugh Stevens, one of my former colleagues, now also a distinguished fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, and Trevor Kennedy, who heads up all things Asia at the Business Council of Canada and who's about to get on a plane to go to participate in uh, a mission to Vietnam and Malaysia. So to save time, I'm going to ask them questions, have a discussion, and then look forward to hearing your questions. So first, economic security and economic coercion have been addressed in the G7 and in other fora. Is any of this relevant to Canada and Taiwan? Should Canada be working with al other allies, including the EU, to mitigate the threat of economic coercion? So first, I'm going to turn to you, Ambassador. Is it on? Yes, it's, it's on. Uh, good uh, morning, everybody, and uh, thanks to the Institute uh, for organizing this important uh, event. Uh, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, welcome to Ottawa. And uh, do, do I have to answer very short uh, answers? Or how Rel should it work? Relatively short, yes. Then answer is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, you can be a little, you can go a little longer than that. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, on this panel. And uh, we we have uh, quite strong position and uh, uh, strong feelings about uh, the the topic and uh, uh, dealing with uh, authoritarian regimes. Uh, in in the world of authoritarian uh, regimes and uh, they are weaponizing trade and uh, and using uh, economic coercion uh, to influence sovereign uh, policy choices and uh, these questions are relevant to every uh, democracy valuing rules based uh, international uh, order to reduce the risk of uh, economic coercion, it is important to minimize economic dependence on uh, unreliable partners. And this means diversifying trade relations, uh, screening uh, FDIs, uh, and also developing new tools to control outbound investment. A little bit into Lithuania, Lithuania's relations with, uh, with different, uh, just, just a few examples. So uh, one, one of the uh, countries, big countries, uh, was never happy with uh, Lithuania's uh, foreign policy. 
which is based on democratic values and uh, principles of security. Uh, China uh, did not appreciate Lithuania rejecting uh, Chinese 5G technology and not allowing China to invest uh, into our strategic critical infrastructure, uh, not selling uh, Klaipeda uh, seaport, leaving 17 plus 1 uh, format, uh, or adopting resolution on crimes against humanity and the Uyghur genocide. Uh, and the recent, uh, recent thing in 2021, by uh, allowing uh, uh, to, to be opened the uh, Taiwanese uh, representative office in, in Lithuania, was just the last drop in, uh, in uh, showing that country what uh, coercive measures uh, really mean. Uh, we, we had a number of examples when uh, somehow we were disappearing from databases, uh, uh, somehow, uh, you know, uh, periods of time for, for other 60 days, for us 90 days, or interbanking system starts, uh, stops working, or, and, and many, many other examples. But uh, right after uh, Taiwanese representation was opened in, in Lithuania, somehow we disappeared from databases and, and exports from Lithuania was uh, almost, almost impossible. So uh, this is the, uh, uh, the country we are dealing with. And then when we talk about uh, coercive measures, should we act together? What should we do? Of course, we have to stick together. We have to work together. And, uh, and another authoritarian example clearly shows us that uh, everything, everything is, uh, is being used at the end of the day against us. Uh, let's look at Russia, how all the taxes collected through, through trade, through energy dependency and, and, and other things are now used uh, for wars, uh, war against, uh, against Ukraine. I'm not, selling that, I'm, I'm not telling that we can compare directly those cases, but we should understand that by, by trading, with authoritarian regimes, we increase their power. By giving them technologies or buying their technologies instead of uh, developing our own technologies, uh, we are strengthening them, etc., etc., etc. So uh, our understanding is, uh, is very simple. Uh, we have to stick together. And, uh, and I think uh, also our case, uh, when, when we were... Uh, our trade uh, got wrong with China, and uh, we put the case forward in WTO when, uh, when many, many uh, partners stepped in, including Canada, showed that by being united and by working together, we can push them back. And, uh, and we should cooperate in, in many of the areas. Canada is very vocal about uh, supply chain uh, diversification. It is crucially important. But we should also talk about uh, technologies, about being able to, uh, to develop technological capabilities on our own, etc., etc., etc. So uh, this would be a bit longer version of my response. That's great. Hugh, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Diana. And uh, like the ambassador, I'd like to thank uh, the IPD, where I'm also a fellow, along with the foundation, for organizing this and to thank uh, Tico. It's nice to see so many old friends in the room. <clears throat> you know, I think as uh, uh, the Deputy Minister, she has said, uh, there's no simple answer to the issue of coercion. And coercion takes uh, many faces, has many, f many forms, uh, is uh, employed by a number of different countries. Uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. So um, when we talk about economic security and economic coercion, they're obviously uh, uh, linked with broader issues, uh, strategic, military issues, and so on. So the immediate question is, uh, uh, should Canada and others be working in, in, uh, uh, with others in like-minded company to push back? I mean, uh, probably the... Uh, 
the uh, answer to uh, pushing back on coercion is, uh, we've already discussed it in, 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 its, in its broadest terms, it involves diversification of trade, uh, it involves uh, cooperation with like-minded partners, including through the G7. It includes relying on the uh, rules-based trading system to the extent that it's still working. Uh, and there is this question that the ambassador raised of uh, how much interdependence or dependence do we have with uh, the regimes exercising the coercion. So it's interesting, of course, we're talking about Chinese coercion <coughs> in, the, in terms of Canada. There is a degree of coercion, it's not that great. I think 5% of our exports go to China. We are perhaps more vulnerable on the import side. Uh, you know, when you compare Canada to Australia, if, if there's a country that is subject to potential uh, Chinese coercion, it would be Australia. So Canada is in a far better position that way. On the other hand, as, as we are all well aware, so what is it, 70%, 75% of Canadian exports go in one direction. And we are also subject, and have been subject for many years, to economic coercion from another economic superpower. Now we have various means of dealing with it because it's not an author authoritarian state, at least not yet. Uh, November's coming, but uh, <laughs> you know, we, uh, uh, Deanna worked at the embassy in Washington and many techniques, finding friends, working with like-minded uh, groups in the U.S., uh, finding uh, groups within the U.S. to push back on uh, certain congressional initiatives if we have to retaliate targeting it so that it, it works because there is a system that you can work with. And of course, with an author authoritarian state, it's much more difficult to do that. It's monolithic. Even if you do have allies within that country, that's not going to work. So uh, in dealing with a very large state like China or perhaps like Russia, of course, one has to stick together. The G7 is clearly one... Um, one forum, uh, it, issues, it issues statements, provides a degree of coordination. I guess the G20, not quite so easy to, to line up everybody, would be another very useful forum. But of course there are others. The, the, the WTO, even though it's limping along, it's, uh, it's important, I think, to continue to use the rules. So if we look at uh, the economic coercion that China exercised against Canada uh, during the Meng Wanzhou 2 Michaels episode, uh, of course, it was not direct retaliation, we're going to block your exports, and as I mentioned, we only have 5%, but if you happen to be from Western Canada and you're a canola grower or you're a pork producer, uh, that could be very, very important. It was, of course, finding a pretext to make things difficult, whether it's uh, uh, dockage in canola or, or um, uh, uh, I think it was f foot and mouth disease in the, in, anyway, the uh, uh, SPS reasons, other sorts of reasons. And so you have to deploy your full uh, range of measures to push back. One of them is to use the rules-based system, to start engaging, to start pushing for the science-based solution so that eventually, if other things fall into place, the country bringing the measure has a way of backing down. So, uh, uh, the, sort of the technical means. But uh, in, in terms of uh, pushing back, uh, retaliating, removing, uh, cu cutting off China, that's easier said than done. I don't think anybody would have a, a, a disagreement with the argument that we should minimize dependence upon authoritarian states. On the other hand, governments don't do business. Business does business. If you are Canadian Tire and you want to fill your stores with products that Canadian consumers want, you're going to be buying a lot of them from China, regardless of whether China is considered by some to be a coercive, aggressive power, uh, a disruptive power as it's labeled in the Indo-Pacific strategy. So governments could do certain things. Um, 5G, Huawei is a good example. Uh, so they can use their regulatory power. We can restrict the export of certain products to, to countries like China and others to the export control list. Um, and of course you can uh, direct trade as the Trump tariffs did against China by imposing tariffs, but at the end of the day there are still limited tools. So the answer is partially blocking but also to uh, pursue alternatives to offer incentives to go elsewhere, which of course is what the Indo-Pacific strategy is about, to diversify, to level the playing field, to open doors, so that uh, one will become less dependent on a state, uh, on a market that can be turned off at will. Uh, let me just leave it there and... Uh
could you elaborate a bit on the Indo-Pacific strategy? I don't know whether everybody in the room knows about it, but what about the uh, economic security aspect of that? Um, and what needs to, should be, what needs to be done in the future in terms of within the, on the uh, umbrella of the Indo-Pacific strategy? So Hugh, and then if Trevor could, you can jump in on that. Sure. <clears throat> well, I doubt if there's anybody here. Nobody would admit to not knowing about the Indo-Pacific strategy, right? <laughs> that, that wonderful term. Um, well, I think it was a long time in coming. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's been rolled out that Canada has now uh, discovered the Asia Pacific. Well, if any of you are old as I am, you remember this isn't the first time this has happened. We had Pacific 2000. Before that, we had various iterations. We, you know, we've been a dialogue partner of ASEAN since, believe it or not, 1967. Uh, we had a very active role in, in ASEAN in the 1990s through CETA. Uh, you know, I guess the high point was this, this, the hosting of APEC in, what year was it? 97. 97. Uh, didn't go all that well. Anyway, we've never done it since. I mean, it's now, what, 27 years and counting, and we've never been able to step up to, to host this, uh, this organization. Um, anyway, so uh, that's all in the past. We, we've, uh, we've come back to the party, we hope. Um, and uh, as, as was mentioned, it's a, it's a multifaceted strategy. I see Jeff there, he's playing a very important part in implementing part of it, you know, uh, military security, trade, uh, trade and investment, people to people links, enhancing our presence in the region. And uh, basically uh, being there for the long run, putting some effort behind it, putting s some institutional building uh, across government through natural resources and agriculture Canada and global affairs and so forth and enhancing our presence, but also making sure that it's front of mind. So it's a mind share issue as well. And to be a mind share issue, you have to have uh, the government, ministers and others attending regularly. So a big part of this, uh, uh, you know, ideally will be to diversify um, that means, although it's not specifically said, sort of away from China. It's China's our biggest market in Asia. Six of our 12 biggest markets, I'm told, are in Asia. So I guess that's Japan, Korea, China, India, Taiwan, and, uh, and probably Hong Kong, which so, you know, lumped, up, lumped in with China. So <clears throat> I don't, you, don't, you don't hear ASEAN amongst any of those countries. So the idea is to try and shift some of uh, our dependence on China trade in Asia. Uh, I mean, when we talk about diversification, we've done CETA for Europe. Asia is an important part of it, but a large part of that is China. So how do we, how do we diversify further? We, we focus on our existing markets in Korea and Japan, and we try and develop new markets uh, in Southeast Asia, and we try and rescue the train wreck that has become Canada-India relations. And uh, that you know there's this, this potential there. So it's about opening up uh, these markets by enhancing our presence, by strengthening the Canadian Chamber network, by a whole range of uh, of issues. At the same time, I guess subtly de-emphasizing China. But although it's all well and good to say that we need to minimize our dependence, as, as I pointed out, it's not that easy to simply uh, redirect supply chains. I mean, even if we're talking about uh, Taiwan and China, uh, the, the Deputy Minister mentioned Foxconn. Well, where does Foxconn do most of its business? It's in China. So there are some ec economic realities that have to be matched along with the, uh, the, the, the broader security and military considerations. Okay, I'm well, happy to jump in there. I, I think um, I was planning to speak mostly about diversification, and I'll try and link it back to Taiwan uh, where I can. Um, but uh, just from the business community standpoint, I think, you know, the government through IPS, and I think this, everyone in the room was, is familiar enough that I can just use the, use the acronym. Um, I do think there's a, there is a focus in the strategy to, to bring uh, focus to different parts of the region. Um, you know, within Northeast Asia or the North Pacific countries, as the government uses in their terminology, um, you know, I think for 20 years, maybe 10, 10 20 years, um, most of the government focus and private sector focus in the region Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific really was on China, um, and and often it was difficult to get business leaders or, or companies to really focus on the region if they couldn't add some China element to that engagement. Uh, I see that changing really quickly. Uh, it's not because companies are leaving China, um, but I think you are starting to see some areas really stand out. 
And, and going back to the North Pacific quickly, um, you know, Japan and Korea are not uh, fast-growing economies. Actually, in the case of Japan, uh, you know, unfortunately, is, is a, a fairly slow uh, economy now within, within the G7 or OECD. Uh, Korea is starting to decelerate, uh, and you have aging populations. But that doesn't tell the whole story for Canada. And I think what you really see when looking at those two partners are uh, an interest in, in economic security, um, and, uh, and, and really Canada has a lot to offer there. And I think Canadian businesses are really leaning in to find opportunities linked to you know, how that relationship can, can, uh, can focus more on security. Um, at the same time, I think uh, looking toward uh, emerging markets, a lot of the emphasis that was on China for greenfield opportunities now is shifting to Southeast Asia. I see a lot of genuine interest now in ASEAN countries. There are some that stand out more than others. Um, and also India, I mean, setting aside our political challenges, we do have a, a significant economic relationship, and I think one that will continue to grow over time. Um, so I think you do see that, you know, in that lens, there is more government emphasis on supporting that, that shift. And we're certainly trying to do our part, but, you know, looking at building out our FTA network, uh, we have a, you know, a Canada ASEAN FTA in the works, and, and hopefully we'll have that concluded next year to kind of coincide with uh, Malaysia's host year. That would be, I think, a really important symbol uh, for the business community and give businesses some extra uh, s uh, security in the region, at the same time pursuing the SEPA with Indonesia, uh, which uh, at least at, at a political level, the goal was to have those concluded later this year. Uh, we remain hopeful, um, you know, hopefully with the transition and the new government there, uh, we'll be able to continue to make progress. But I think those two additions, uh, in addition to other, other uh, FTAs, would be helpful for Canada. Um, and also, you know, as Deanna noted, I I'm heading to the region uh, later today uh, didn't, didn't choose the wisest flight, but I'm leaving, leaving uh, midnight tonight, so I have a very long day. But I am heading to Southeast Asia, and the reason why I'm going there is um, next week we're participating in the Team Canada trade mission to Malaysia and Vietnam. Uh, we participated in the first Team Canada trade mission under the IPS uh, in, in Japan late last year. Um, it was incredible. I mean, there were several hundred Canadian businesses there, many associations, many executives, um, you know, with the minister and senior officials. Uh, it is incredible to see. Now, we have to keep this up and, and ensure there's a steady drumbeat, but uh, I know in talking to our counterparts in Japan for that first mission, the business community, the government, uh, it was extremely well received. And so next week, uh, first mission to Southeast Asia, to Malaysia and Vietnam. I know later this year there are plans for the, for the, for the Philippines and Indonesia. And, and also next month we'll be headed to Korea for, for another Team Canada trade mission. So there's a lot of engagement, uh, and I think we, uh, you know, we found a role in that as the business community. So we are working toward diversification. I mean, ultimately, we have to start seeing differences in the trade flows and investment flows. But uh, I think there's some progress, given that you know IPS is, uh, I guess, only uh, a little over a year old at this stage. Um, where we're missing, I think, and again, I hope I'm not going over my time here, but I did want to speak very briefly about resources, um, because I think if there's one thing that was missing in IPS, it really was the emphasis on Canadian resources and what contribution uh, it can make to regional security. Um, you know, we take one single project like LNG Canada. Uh, LNG Canada, uh, at least if, we're, if we take the, the word of Japanese officials, they view this as a, as a project linked to their national security. Um, it will replace 9% of the gas that Japan currently imports from Russia. That's significant. That will give Canada a significant role in the region, but that's one project. Uh, you can look all, all across the region, uh, looking even at Taiwan's energy mix, you know, Canada needs resource, or we need, uh, we need infrastructure, we need policy to support the construction of infrastructure, um, but Canada could have a significant role to play in, in, in regional security uh, through our resources. We had one senior Korean official in a recent visit tell us um, that as uh, under the UN administration, they focus on, on becoming a globally pivotal power, that's the, that's the terminology, um, that Korea needs resource security. And they're looking to countries like Canada for their security. Uh, if we can't deliver, Korea can't embrace the foreign policy it wants. Uh, otherwise, it, it relies on, on le less stable, secure suppliers. And I think if you look across Southeast Asia, there's a similar dynamic. Not every economy. Uh, every, every economy has different energy demands or different resource demands. But whether you look at Vietnam and its transition to first LNG and then other forms of, of, of resources moving away from coal, there's a role for Canada. I know the Philippines is building LNG import infrastructure. Uh, there's a role for nuclear in this. There's a role for hydrogen. There's a lot that Canada can contribute, but, but IPS, I don't think, put a lot of emphasis on that at, at this stage. That doesn't mean Canada doesn't have to put an emphasis on it going forward. So uh, I think we have a lot of advantages and, and a significant contribution we can make to peace and security in the region uh, if we learn how to, uh, to support our partners through, um, through one of our greatest advantages. So maybe I'll, I'll pause on that point. But uh, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to come back to it, particularly in terms of economic interdependence and how that affects coercion. But first, I want to go back 
to you, Your Excellency. Could you talk about how did Lithuania weather economic coercion from China and if there's anything that you can see in terms of lessons for Canada and Taiwan? So uh, we, I would say we not only uh, resisted uh, uh, to aggressive and unjustified uh, economic coercion from China in recent years, but even uh, became stronger. And uh, I would say our principal position uh, in uh, whatever you call it, decoupling or dealing de or de-risking or whatever name we, we use, uh, led us to, to new uh, really strong uh, partnerships. So uh, uh, in the last five years, we, we opened uh, embassies in Australia, Korea, Singapore, office in uh, in Taipei. Uh, just last year uh, was an announcement about uh, strategic partnership with uh, with Japan. Uh, so uh, partners uh, from civilized democratic uh, world uh, immediately stepped in uh, and uh, helped us to find other ways for you know trading goods, de developing uh, technological uh, partnerships, etc., etc., etc. Coming back to to our case uh, in uh, in in WTO and uh, what happened in 2021. Uh, it led to uh, another great development was an adoption of uh, anti-coercion instrument uh, by European Union uh, end of uh, end of uh, last year, uh, which uh, which has uh, potential to introduce uh, countermeasures, uh, uh, imposing uh, tariffs, uh, restriction of trade and services. Uh, FDIs, public procurements, and, and other possible instruments to be used uh, in case of uh, uh, measures uh, by, by regimes would be imposed on one, one of the countries. But uh, the biggest... Uh, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the result, uh, or the most important thing uh, from, from our case, I would say, was uh, unity and uh, collective uh, action uh, against uh, the coercive uh, measures. Uh, what, uh, what I would see as, uh, as uh, lessons for Canada and Taiwan, look, we are all in the a, in a same boat. So uh, we, uh, Lithuania has Indo-Pacific strategy as well. Uh, important <coughs> thing is uh, resources and uh, proper implementation of, uh, of strategies, and that's, that's the way forward. Uh, of course, you, you are right uh, to, when, when you say that uh, businesses, uh, businesses uh, operate on their own and they need some incentives. So by strategies, by instruments, we create incentives for businesses to redirect uh, the flow of uh, of goods or uh, or help them invest into uh, further cooperation, uh, changing supply chains, etc., uh, etc. Et so, I will stop here. Maybe. Any other comments from? Well, you know, we talked a bit about how you push back against economic coercion through economic means, uh, the diversification, but as the ambassadors pointed out, there's obviously, there's very often a political dimension to this. And in Canada's case, during the uh, hostage diplomacy that was exercised by the Chinese, um, we did take a number of diplomatic initiatives. Um, I, I, I'm not an expert in this area, but uh, I know that we, we pushed for this initiative against arbitrary detention and state-to-state -state relations. I don't know exactly what the status of that is, but it, you know, it was a declaration, it's work in progress. Uh, it's important because uh, the weaponization of trade for other purposes is, uh, you know, is a growing concern, um, whether it's Russia, whether it's China. 
whether it's others. So uh, it's, it's important to work within a broader community. We took, you, you know, the original question, Deanna, was about the G7, but of course there are other forums, uh, OECD, uh, even, even, or including, of course, the UN, uh, trying to find, trying to coordinate through these, uh, you know, various international commodity groups and so on. So any country uh, that is not a superpower has to find, um, has to find people to work with, whether it's a, uh, a middle power, if Canada is still a middle power, or, or a country like Lithuania, I can't speak for Lithuania, or any of the other countries. I mean, with the, the uh, it, it's, it, 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 it's, there you go, thank you. So it's quite obvious that, uh, you know, you either, you either hang separately or you hang together. So Trevor, I'd like to go back to you. You were talking about, um, I was intrigued by your comment about resources. Um, when you look at, um, Vulnerabilities in supply chains, for example. Both Canada and Taiwan have vulnerabilities. Um, and so I'm wondering how do you see, um, how can you address economic coercion and mitigate all vulnerabilities? And how could Canada bolster Taiwan's economic resilience in facing economic coercion from the People's Republic of China? And then maybe looking at technology and innovation, how they can enhance economic security. I actually think there's quite a bit that Canada and Taiwan can do to support each other's economic security, the private sectors and the governments. Um, but I'll start with, a, I guess, a, a point that might sound repetitive. Um, but it, it is a bit surprising that Taiwan hasn't really come up in the conversation around Canada's resources and security. I'd say at the same time, we, we don't really hear that from Taiwanese officials or the private sector as well. Uh, but surely there's a there's a role for Canada to play, and and so, um, you know, I think as as it's important to learn more about that and, and think what through uh, you know what contributions we can make. Just over the weekend, there was a piece on the Financial Times. I don't know if some folks in the room had a chance to read it, uh, but it was a reference to a, a think tank in Taiwan uh, conducting some analysis around um, the country's electricity supply, principally, uh, but it highlighted some serious vulnerabilities, including with the country's existing or the, the economy's existing uh, economic strategy. Um, and uh, you, know, you would imagine there'd be a role for Canada, if, if whether that's through hydrogen or through LNG, uh, if there's a, a continued existence of civilian nuclear as well, and Canada has a lot of strengths in, in that sector. Um, so it's just a, it's, it's a bit of a, a surprise, but I think there's still some role for, for Canada there to support uh, Taiwan. And at the same time, you know, we, we benefit from Taiwanese investment uh, and ta Taiwanese technology. Just before the holidays, there was a senior official here and, and provided a presentation around uh, I guess the growing global uh, diversification of Taiwanese investment. So companies like TSMC and others, uh, historically, most of the investment being in China for manufacturing in China, but now a strategy focused on building regional supply chains. So a lot more investment in Southeast Asia, some investment in places, well, for, in the case of TSMC, in uh, Kumamoto and, and, and Kyushu in Japan, uh, but also in North America. I mean, TSMC is investing here. Other Taiwanese companies are investing uh, in North America. So whether that investment ends up in Canada ultimately or within North America, uh, we benefit from a, a supply chain that, that links to our North American supply chain, uh, enhances our competitiveness, but also builds out our security. Um, and, and, you know, whether that's through semiconductors or other advanced technologies, I think there's quite a bit that Canada can benefit from. Um, so I think in, in just understanding how our two economies can support each other to enhance our economic security and competitiveness is important. I don't have the answers to that now, but I, I am starting to see, at least on the investment side, I think some important progress. Um, it would also be helpful to understand what we can contribute in the way of our, our natural resources to enhance uh, Taiwanese security. Thanks. Hugh, any comments on that? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it, I talked about uh, diversification North Asia to uh, uh, Korea and uh, Japan, both of which, as was pointed out, are slowing down as economies. Even China is slowing down. So obviously Taiwan, uh, is a is a is a small but important market. You know, what 23 million people, uh, but punches above its weight economically. It was interesting, Trevor. You were talking about uh, Team Canada missions as being one to Japan, one now to Vietnam. Maybe the next time the Business Council is talking to Global Affairs about where a Team Canada mission is going, it could it could be a Team Canada mission to Taiwan. Why not one to Japan and Taiwan? It's all economic. It's all within the ambit of the uh, the one china policy and to follow on the theme that we've been 
that's been mentioned a couple of times here, Canada tends to self-censor excessively in terms of what it could or could not do with Taiwan, so why not a Team Canada mission? And I guess if Global Affairs gets really nervous, the minister could uh, be, be sick for the two or three days that uh, uh, the, the, the mission is in Taiwan and could be led by somebody else if that's, the, if that's the issue. But I mean, I think that's something we need to look at. You mentioned energy. I think that's really important. You know, t we, the, the, there's an MOU on clean energy. Taiwan has a lot of wind farms. They're in the Taiwan Strait. The Taiwan Strait's vulnerable. There's clearly a, a role there for Canada, both in, clean, in terms of clean energy uh, and in uh, LNG exports. I mean, that's going to be the big area, I think, where we can do some heavy lifting, where we can bring something unique to the region. Um, we need to work together on uh, strategic issues. We talk about supply chains. Everybody is well aware of the predominant role that uh, TSMC and others, other companies uh, play in terms of production of semiconductors, integrated circuits and chips and so forth, and that does clearly lead to a vulnerability. And it's kind of interesting to see that TSMC's biggest, next biggest investment, not in, not in China, it's in Arizona, where its big fab is being built. Um, so that's good for North American supply chains and for the automotive industry that is integrated between Canada and the U.S. U.S. vulnerability is our vulnerability in this area. Uh, I'm sure that the Taiwanese are well aware that to the extent that uh, TSMC becomes uh, embedded in the U.S., it's, it's not quite the same card to play in terms of strategic vulnerability. So I am told that, uh, you know, the crown jewels will continue to be kept in Taiwan, that uh, TSMC will continue to develop all its cutting-edge materials in Taiwan. And, of course, it's, it's, it's centered in Taiwan, in, 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 in the Sinju Industrial Park and so forth. But that's, that is a vulnerability, um, and even Taiwan has to uh, diversify to some extent. But beyond that vulnerability of that specific commodity, and again, it was mentioned earlier, is the whole issue of the Taiwan Straits. 45%, or the Taiwan Strait, I guess I should say, 45% of the world's container traffic goes through this strait, and that's not surprising because eight of the 10 largest container ports in the world border on that strait. The only other two in the top 10 that aren't in China, or Hong Kong, are uh, Busan and Singapore. So, uh, you know, the, the consequences for interruption of the sea lines of communication and maritime trade for Korea, Japan, uh, and indeed China's role in the world are absolutely catastrophic if something happens in the Taiwan Strait. So that is the other really significant vulnerability, and that is where Canada needs to step up uh, on, a, on a diplomatic and military um, facet of its work. So we are, to some extent. Uh, the, the Royal Canadian Navy has done freedom of navigation passage of the Taiwan Strait, safely tucked in behind a larger U.S. warship most of the time, just in case anything really goes sideways. But, I mean, we are making a modest contribution. We continue to uh, work with uh, the pack rim exercises. We are doing uh, uh, interdiction on North Korean sanctions, busting, and so forth. Uh, and if, indeed, the Indo-Pacific strategy, if you've read it, has kind of a military component, and some of the money goes to DND. Uh, it's badly in need of it, um, not only to keep those ships going, but to staff those ships as well. So we need to play a role. There's been people have talked about, well, you know, could, should Canada become part of uh, AUKUS, the, uh, you know, the the pact that is more than just a nuclear submarine pact, it's also to exchange technology and so forth. And I actually heard Gen General Ayer saying that uh, there are some aspects of AUKUS that would be attractive to Canada, not so much the issue of uh, building submarines, uh, but just, just being part of that. That's, a, that's a, an issue for the government to look at. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a broader issue. Uh, pushing back uh, through economic means, through diversification, through working for others, through others is one side of it, but there's a whole other piece, a whole diplomatic military piece that uh, we are struggling, I think, to find a role that we don't want to become um, simply uh, bag carriers for a U.S. freedom of uh, FOIP, was it free, free, freedom of, um, yeah, I forget what FOIP stands for, anyway, the, Indo, the free and open, free Indo -Pacific. And open Indo, -Pacific. Indo Pacific, thank you. Uh, we'd like to find a role for ourselves, but we have to recognize, I think, that uh, our role 
will be differentiated. If it's differentiated, it won't be differentiated that much. You need to, at the end of the day, find comfort uh, with friends who are uh, moving the same direction as you are. Thank you. I'm very intrigued by this whole concept of um, economic, it's not a concept, it's a reality of economic interdependence. Uh, I think Taiwan, it is, could be argued, has done extremely well at managing uh, in economic interdependence in the sense that, and, and Korea and Japan as well, uh, countries that have China as their major uh, trading partner, uh, but at the same time, they are also involved with the United States, and of course we see uh, potential for disruption of that. But I'm wondering, uh, from the business, so there's the business perspective, and then I'd like to go back to the ambassador to talk about what the EU, can you elaborate a bit further on what the EU has done in terms of the um, policy that you were talking about earlier on economic coercion, and how from the business community's perspective, if you, especially with the U.S.-China strategic competition and all the trade measures, sometimes companies have to na navigate between U.S. measures and fear of China retaliation as well. I think arguably Taiwan has managed this pretty well, but if you have any comments on that, I think that is going to be, I think the crux of the issue going forward is how to manage this, particularly for countries in Asia. Uh, so <clears throat> EU uh, as, a, as a union, uh, we should understand that it's uh, a, a European Union and its institutions are responsible for external trade means that European Commission is negotiating on behalf of uh, members of, uh, of European Union. So uh, powers of European Union and, uh, and the Commission are, are really high. And, uh, and here the instrument, uh, uh, anti-coercion uh, instrument, which was uh, approved uh, end of last year, uh, introduces possibility to, to have uh, certain measures uh, uh, as a response to certain uh, actions by by unfriendly unfriendly actors, but uh, but on a positive agenda side, uh, of course, European Union understanding the uh, the need of the risking and the coupling or whatever we call it, uh, uh, while understanding it, uh, it's working uh, positively on developing relations with uh, reliable partners. And uh, if we talk about Canada, yes, we have a CETA agreement, and uh, we had a number of uh, strategic uh, dialogue uh, sessions on, on the highest level between European Union leadership and Canadian uh, leadership, be it uh, in the area of uh, raw materials and possibility to work on those uh, without including, you know, for state actors or be it uh, uh, energy, uh, green uh, uh, transition and, and many, many other areas. So, so European and same, same dialogues are happening uh, around the world with, uh, with all the other partners, uh, reliable partners as well. So uh, EU is doing uh, really a lot uh, to, 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 to be able to address the challenges we are facing. Let me jump on this one. Yeah, sure. Sure. So just maybe quickly on, on the U.S.-China rivalry. I mean, it's an ongoing challenge, I think, for every business around the world, um, at least if you're a global business. Um, but I'd say that every, every business is different. Uh, if you look at, say, Canadian companies or large Canadian companies, um, you know, in many cases, being an international business in Canada means you have business in the United States, and that's it. I think for a lot of Canadian companies, that is the big market, and, and that is, I think, where, where most of our economic interests are currently tied. But there are businesses that entirely base their growth on, on China or they base their growth on, on the Indo-Pacific region. So it's really, I think it is a, it's, it's a complex picture out there. Um, and I think that if, if you know, Canada ever has to choose, we know that the United States comes first. It's our most important trade partner, our most important ally. Um, but I don't think we really have to choose in the sense that you have to leave one market for the other. Um, you know, the approach that we've long advocated for, and I think it's pretty close to the government's policy, is, is eyes wide open. I think the government uses clear-eyed as the approach. That also applies to the United States as well. I mean, we look at our, our counterparts in, in the U.S. 
Um, while the, certainly the strategic lens is, is changing the nature of business, and that's, that will continue, uh, there's a lot of business that isn't strategic. And uh, if you look at you know, some of the large business associations in the U.S. or large businesses uh, continue to have significant economic interests in China, and, and in many cases, uh, they don't hide from that. I think there are, there are many sectors in the United States that, that continue to put a, a real, real value on that relationship. So I don't think anyone is talking about completely leaving China. There's just acknowledgement that there are strategic sectors um, and those sectors, you know, that's where we're going to focus on engaging with our close, like-minded partners and our allies. But a lot of the business, and uh, I think Suzanne Clark, the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, she had some lines, something along the lines of, you know, don't mix up like semiconductors and baseball caps. They're two different things. And so, um, and she has it much better than I do. But anyway, I'd, I'd recommend looking at her remarks to get a sense of how the U.S. business community thinks about this. It's not. It's not such a clear sense that we need to we need to leave the market and there's no future for for the bilateral business uh, community. So, you know, Dan, interdependence is, is is interesting because of course, it can be argued that it is also a constraint on the larger power, uh, and uh, but of course it also gives them leverage. I mean, in terms of I, I mentioned how Canada's exports to China are. Um, not insignificant uh, for certain sectors, but of course we're nothing. We're not vulnerable to the extent that other countries are. But we do have a degree of vulnerability in terms of our manufacturing. So uh, I know Global Affairs did a study three or four years ago in, in terms of looking at inputs, and uh, the the figure that uh, it, it depends on which sector, of course. But a lot of components, a lot of electronics, et cetera, et cetera, come from China. Uh, something. So the figure I, caught my mind my attention was 50% of product inputs in Canada have some Chinese uh, content. Now, there's a whole, uh, uh, um, there's whole pressure to diversify from China, not just for strategic issues, reasons, and because of weaponization, but also because of rising costs in China and so forth. So that we know a lot of that uh, assembly work and manufacturing and so on is now being pushed out to uh, uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, and so forth. So that's just sort of an economic uh, reality that is uh, that, that, that's happening. So um, that's one example. If you look at Taiwan and China, uh, that's it's an, also an interesting case. So at one point, Taiwan was exporting about 50% of its commodities to China. That's coming down there, going through exactly the same kind of de-risking scenarios that we have, uh, that we've been going through. But still, 35% of Taiwan's exports go to China, and a lot of them are products that China needs. It doesn't need pineapples, so we can slap a ban on Taiwanese pineapples, and that hurts Taiwanese farmers who are in the southern part of Taiwan who, you know, can vote, et cetera. Um, but uh, the, uh, the components and the investment and uh, the, uh, the, the high-tech trade that's going on between Taiwan and China also uh, put a degree of... Uh, uh, restraint, perhaps, on China. Now, I'm not suggesting that if the balloon went up and China really decided that uh, it, it had to do something irrational, that that would be a constraining factor. But surely, in terms of looking at the policy mix, the fact that there is this interdependence is also a factor that cuts both ways. Even on the, the famous, you know, canola ban, uh, sure, China stopped importing canola from Canada, but, you know, they needed canola. So where did they get it from? They got it from the UAE. Where did the UAE get it from? They got it from Canada. So, I mean, world trade has a way of also dealing with some of these issues. The, the technology ban, the technology war, I would almost call it, that the U.S. is waging on China now is putting country companies like, you know, Microsoft and, uh, and Apple and uh, Tesla now, uh, others in a really difficult position, and they're going to have to see to what extent they can continue to navigate through these waters, being pressured on the one hand by Congress, on the other hand, falling, you know, wanting to do business in China and having huge investments in China that could end up becoming captive investments if they're not careful. Thanks very much. I have one more question, but then I'd like to uh, please come up and uh, ask your questions. We want to hear from you. Um, so. Following on uh, what we've just been talking about, when you think about um, the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act in the U.S., and there's been other legislation, um, so this is a measure to increase economic security. At least that is the objective. And, and as such can be regarded as a way to uh, confront economic coercion. So do you see uh, the possibility of 
some kind of collaboration on this type so that we do, we encourage friend shoring, but we have a lot of friends. Uh, is this one way to uh, address the issue? Or how do you see the potential for collaboration on uh, economic coercion through domestic policy? That's for you, Trevor. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Easy question. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, this is kind of my, my old area of responsibility, I guess, but, you know, talking about U.S. policy, um, you know, I, I think the United States early on with the IRA and, and CHIPS, uh, but particularly the IRA, there was a, a real surprise, I think, across much of, much of the world. Many of the U.S.'s like-minded partners uh, really felt that, uh, that you know, the IRA was harmful to their, their economies, that there wasn't a role for them. Um, Canada was fortunate that, you know, we were, we were counted, at least as part of the North American supply chain, and fortunately we have a USMC Kuzma as a, as a trade agreement to, to really support that. But I think what you've seen over time um, you know, expanding the concept to, to, North, to free trade partners and then eventually through, through the IPEF. And uh, it seems like there's, a, there's an effort, at least by the, the current administration, um, to bring in as many uh, U.S. partners as possible into, uh, what is it, the um, a small yard high fences? Is that the phrase that uh, Jake Sullivan uses? So, you know, I think to, there's an attempt to bring in more parties so that they, everyone can participate and it isn't harmful for one economy or the other. And at the same time, I don't think it's in the interest of the U.S. or, or Europe or others to, to have a race to the bottom. I know there's still ongoing conversations between the European Union and the, and the United States around how to navigate um, U.S. industrial policy. But um, I, I think there is, a, there is, I think, an effort to ensure these policies that, that are meant to in, ensure economic security in the United States don't necessarily come at the expense of U.S. allies and partners around the world. So a lot of work to do. And, of course, Canada's had its own response to, to ensure that you know, we're, we're also remaining competitive. I know other jurisdictions have done the same, but, you know, I think for early on there was a, a real concern and, and almost a panic around the world about how to respond to the U.S., and I think over time um, they've managed to bring more, more parties in. If you're not a U.S. FTA partner, l like Japan, for instance, although I guess now they have an executive agreement, I, you know, I think there's still some uncertainty there, but certainly the, the, the countries that have, uh, you know, uh, comprehensive free trade agreements, uh, South Korea, Australia, of course, uh, you know, Canada and others, uh, I think we found a, a role and a, and a place to, to play. But ideally, you know, we want, it's always helpful when, when like-minded par partners coordinate. And, uh, and I'll just go back to the IPEF piece to say that, you know, something that we've, we've been quite vocal about at the Business Council, uh, we think was a real missed opportunity for Canada not to join IPEF from its outset. Uh, we should have been quite clear from, from the, the beginning that Canada should have participated in those discussions. Um, you know, now I know the government and, and through the State Department that there's been some expression of interest in having Canada participate, uh, but many of the negotiations have already concluded at this stage and there's still no role for Canada. So, um, so in the interest of coordinating with all of our like-minded partners, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, with the United States, we are still missing fr from a key four. And so it's, it is important for Canada uh, to find a way to get involved in IPEF and as soon as possible because, um, you know, uh, once again, uh, much of the work is done. and. And uh, even if this just evolves into a regular ministerial between many important ministries among all, all, all the IPEF countries, it's a, it's a real loss for Canada not to have a seat at the table. You know, it's interesting, over the years, many people here have been watching, I mean, looking at Jonathan Fried and others, you know, dealing with the U.S., the attempt is always to try and knock the sharp edges off to mitigate, and then if we can't, get inside the tent so that if there is a high wall, we're, uh, we're, we're at least uh, the damage is reduced. I hope... You're right that Kusma is going to protect us. I'm not, of course, it's coming up for renewal and year after next. And uh, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, storm clouds on the horizon, not the least of which, of course, is uh, what's happening this coming November in the U.S. election. Okay, I have one more, but really, uh, I'm going to turn to, um, let's see, somebody like the Deputy Minister. Perhaps you would like to ask a question. Um, okay, well, you're off the hook, but because <laughs> we have somebody here. But honestly, we would love it if you asked us a question, because we listen to your excellent speech, and we would love to hear what you think about us. But anyway, okay, go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Samuel Blanov. I'm a student at Chihuahua. I'm uh, not a big fan of climate change in general, and I'd like to be l for it to be less of it. Uh, and China is kind of positioning itself as a very big player in green energy. Is this an avenue for cooperation or is this another risk for economic coercion? 
especially in the context of Taiwan having not the most secure energy mix and not the greenest one, what should be done on the topic of green transition and green energy? Who would like to take that? Well, if you look at the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, one of the, um, I guess, one of the pillars talks a lot about sustainability and uh, within that, of course, is the whole issue of climate change. So there's an area there for Canada to do considerable work. Uh, clearly, it's high on the government's agenda here. It's a very hot uh, political topic at the moment, the, uh, the price on carbon and so on. Um, but there's, there's lots that we can do in terms of working with uh, uh, countries in the region, including China. Uh, I mean, if you don't deal with China, as you point out, on, on, on climate change and green energy, you're just all those other efforts go to naught. So that is something where we do have to engage China. And in fact, the strategy has been very clear. Uh, I don't think it was articulated as, 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 uh, uh, as, as well as it could have been initially, but basically it's, you know, we compete with China uh, where necessary and we cooperate where we can or something like that. And there's lots of areas for cooperation and, and climate change has got to be a big one. Um, so at the same time, we're trying to uh, de-risk de and uh, uh, at least from a U.S. perspective, uh, control certain technologies. On the other hand, uh, China is both a major polluter and a major solution to the uh, to climate change problems with its uh, EV industry and so forth. So, uh, I mean, I think this is an area that, uh, it, uh, it, you know, it, it is, it's an existential issue for, uh, for for all of us, and so we can't box off a country like China. We have to find a way to do it, and uh, there is funding in the Indo-Pacific strategy to deal with that particular aspect. Actually, if I could just jump in yes. on that quickly. Yes, yeah, please I, I, do. I'll use a, a country as an example here, I think, where Canada can really help. Um, you know, across the Indo-Pacific region, every, every you know, country is different, their economic policy is different. I'm going to use Vietnam as an example just because I'm, I'm going to be there next week and I've been doing a lot of research. I know Dr. Tran from the Vietnamese Embassy is here too and probably uh, I hope I'm giving correct information here about, about Vietnam. Um, but, you know, looking at the, at the market, you know, Vietnam is rapidly industrializing. It's more advanced manufacturing. Um, and with that, it's also working to transition away from coal. Um, you know, they went from importing uh, zero LNG last year to now having one small facility, they can import 1 million tons of LNG now, but by 2035, the goal is to have 35 million tons per year. That'd be two LNG Canada's plus. Um, you know, and, and if, if Canada wanted to, to be a serious player in the energy market, uh, it might result in some, some, a small increase in emissions in Canada, but if we're helping an economy like Vietnam move away from coal, I think we can do some real good for, for global uh, climate change. So we have to think about it in the big picture and how, how our resources can be used to help countries that want to move away from uh, dirtier f uh, forms of fuel. It's also a tremendous opportunity for nuclear across the region. Southeast Asia um, does not have uh, much of a history. In fact, I don't think any history of, of civilian nuclear at all, but there's a lot of interest now, and including toward SMRs as, as that technology becomes viable. And Canada is, is already a leader in that space. So. I think we have a lot we can bring to the table, and as long as we understand that by taking action in Canada, we're helping to reduce emissions around the world, you know, I think we, we can do some great work. And I would just add that um, China's predominance on solar pan on the solar sector, I think it, it behooves us to try to collaborate as much as possible. It wouldn't be in their interest to use this as a weapon of economic coercion because they have so many markets that are dependent upon them and that would... But that doesn't that hasn't stopped countries in the past, so we'd see. Anyway, Tristan, you had a question. Uh, yes, uh, good good to see you again. Um, so I actually have two, uh, just based on one thing that you just said. Uh, so my first is um, given the Taiwanese agricultural sector big uh, voting block, big for uh, way of China to you know have economic coercion to affect you know farmers in Taiwan. So we know that you know the pineapple was a big product uh, that was banned, um, and that is very familiar to us uh, Canadians. However, there are many other fruits uh, and uh, products from Taiwan that, uh, if you were to bring them to a Canadian, they'd say it's not just exotic, but it's completely alien. So you know, I wouldn't say that there's much um, 
you know, trade with those uh, products as it would be for like something like a pineapple. So do you think that there is room for the Canadian or Taiwanese government to uh, create interest or educate people on new products to create new economic ties? And the second question that just came up was, you talked about nuclear energy uh, with Taiwan. Uh, is that a good idea, given uh, the relationship between China and Taiwan, given that perhaps nuclear would be a, uh, a soft spot for China to see if Taiwan, Taiwan were to get nuclear energy maybe a threat? Or would it be a threat to Taiwan in particular if you know it was attacked and that nuclear reactor was sabotaged in some way? So, what is uh, the you know nuclear energy front in terms of you know Taiwan in relationship to China? I may I jump on that one first. Uh, I, I just say in the case of, of nuclear. So it, I may be mistaken here, but I think Taiwan does have uh, does have several reactors, uh, mostly in the north, um, but some in the south as well. Uh, but the policy is to move away to to, to shut those facilities down by 2025. Um, not going to comment on a, on another jurisdiction's energy policy. Um, but if there was an interest in re-embracing the role of nuclear, as we're seeing across uh, across the region, you know, Japan, which you know had a, had a very strong policy against nuclear, at least uh, following Fukushima Daiichi, um, and in Korea as well now, under the UN administration, I think a re-embrace of uh, of nuclear. Um, I, you know, I think there seems to be a moment now in the world. I think it, there's an acknowledgement that nuclear is is one of the essential ingredients to to achieving our climate change targets. So. You know, if, if Taiwan uh, does want to scale up its, its civilian nuclear, uh, I would hope there's a role for Canada. I think General Electric largely is the, the lead or historically has been the lead. Um, there may have been a role for Canada in the past. Uh, I wouldn't be aware. But if, if policy changes, hopefully there's a, a role for Canada in the sense that we, we see some opportunities across uh, the rest of the region. Uh, just on, on economic coercion, I, I can say just to... Uh, uh, just as a, as a fan of these, um, and I don't know if this is a result of, of you know Taiwanese farmers having to find new markets uh, at Costco or at TNT. You can now buy Taiwanese pineapple cakes, uh, which which are lovely. Uh, I don't know if you can buy produce directly, um, but in a scenario I'm more familiar with, uh, Japan recently uh, did experience a ban on seafood exports to to China following um, uh, the, the wastewater issue with Fukushima Daiichi. And and to my understanding, uh, there was a lot of concern in the sector initially. But they did find customers. Uh, Hong Kong is importing more Japanese seafood now. Uh, I think you can buy more Japanese seafood in, in, in North America now. So it is, it is finding its way to other markets. There's a disruption there. It's not an ideal circumstance to go through. Um, but you can find other markets and find other security uh, working in close partnership with, with your government and like-minded partners. So uh, that issue has not been resolved, I guess, on the seafood side. But um, you know, I, I think that many of Japan's like-minded partners have been able to step up and and purchase many of the, the products that have been affected. So um, hopefully in the case of Taiwan with pineapples and other, other, other goods that have been affected, uh, their farmers have been able to find new markets and hopefully with uh, in a longer term lens and, and with more secure partners. Well, I'll make two comments um, on agriculture. Pineapples or, or uh, uh, wax apples or what, what other fruits that are produced in Taiwan. You know, like many countries, uh, Taiwan is not really that dependent upon agriculture. It's a fairly small part of the economy, but it has disproportionate political power, just as in this country with uh, supply management and so on. Um, so, you know, China hit back at, uh, at uh, pineapples. Only 1% of uh, Taiwan's exports to China are in agriculture area, so it's not very significant from a global perspective or from a total trade perspective. But of course, it hit at the, that particular uh, growing area. Um, likewise, uh, the deputy minister talked about how Taiwan getting ready and has got ready for CPTPP uh, accession. But the resistance sectors were agriculture, as in Japan, uh, you know, rice growers and so forth. So it's a small sector. Uh, if economically and in terms of the total population, but it has disproportionate power. You know, whether there's a market in, in uh, Canada for Taiwanese pineapples versus pineapples grown in Central America, I have absolutely no idea. It all depends upon the quality of the pineapple and the price. I mean, I think when people go to the store today, they look at the price of bananas. They don't look like, they don't look where they've come from. On nuclear, um, I think you're right, there are some reactors and Taiwan's going through the same existential issue as to how much reliance should there be on nuclear. 
interestingly, the Canada, of course, is uh, is shifting back into nuclear. The uh, the uh, you know Darlington and others are going to be refurbished. There's talk about SMRs being the solution to to climate change and so forth. Um, if you want to sort of pull back, uh, pull the scab off, there's a long history of uh, the Taiwan Research Reactor and Canadian involvement way back when, uh, and that that was closed down. That that related at one point to suspicions that Taiwan was embarked upon a weapons program. I mean, this is long, this is long before Taiwan, Taiwan democracy. This was under the KMT and so forth. So there's a sort of a sensitivity there to, to this particular issue. You have to be, you have to be aware of the history. Uh, I mean, that said, uh, you know, the, uh, the Korean Peninsula is, if, if it's not a hotbed of, of nuclear tension, I don't know what is, and we've sold nuclear reactors to uh, KEPCO and so on, uh, and, uh, you know, Wilsung and others, as, as, as Ron well knows, that, you know, ACL was, uh, Korea was a big customer for the ACL. I think when we sold them to China, for Pete's sake. So, I mean, uh, you know, you have to look back at the, at, at the history of this, but uh, in terms of peaceful nuclear energy, um, uh, if Taiwan became a market, uh, uh, I think that probably could be, uh, you know, I, I don't think the tensions would, would, would be the biggest issue. The biggest issue would be acceptability of nuclear for the Taiwanese people, the price, the financing, whether Canada is still in a position to provide that kind of uh, technology, how safe the technology was, how much it could be fenced off from any kind of diversion and so on. I would just like to point out here as well that when you're looking at economic interdependence and its impact on coercion, this is all very targeted. Yes, you might hear, I mean, Freedom Pineapples was a, was a big deal for Japan, and, but you know, when you look at actual Taiwan, Japan, and, and well, China, uh, inter, sort of all the investments that are, that are part of the uh, ecostructure that is chips, et cetera, those aren't touched because those are too important. So, and it's saying with the US and dealing with China has to be very targeted. So that's the challenge with coercion. You have to be very targeted in terms of what you're gonna coerce. And we have a question, thank you. Uh, my name is... Do you have it? Yeah. Uh, my name is Harry Zhen. Uh, I'm the head of the Taiwan office uh, in Canada. Well, uh, there are so many big ideas, so it's difficult to digest them all at once. Uh, but I, uh, I think uh, probably most people uh, here would agree that uh, only uh, a few years ago, it was still possible to draw a line, a division, between economy and uh, the geopolitics. Uh, but uh, that line is getting blur and blur, and it's almost non-existent. Uh, there's so many uh, economic terms that you have raised uh, this morning, including economic coercion. It wasn't there. It wasn't in our terminology before the pandemic. Uh, like uh, de-risking or decoupling uh, is it's new as well. Or uh, friendshoring, it was only appeared uh, in uh, it only appeared in 2002 in the United States. So uh, all these terms seem to me uh, has. Uh, has carried a geopolitical implication. And uh, uh, even when we talk about uh, French Orient this morning, um, I don't know uh, if you ask this uh, question uh, to define it as a prelude uh, or for uh, the, the government to initiate a economic policy or uh, this uh, idea of French Orient as a recognition of the a, a, a fate a complete that uh, every country or the business should f follow that route uh, because uh, I think uh, it would not be necessary uh, if we don't have a uh, economic coercion uh, from some unfriendly countries then probably it is not necessary for us to talk about the relocation of the supply chain and it is also from there that uh, you think that the French shoring became uh, necessary and, and so uh, somehow, uh, the cost of a business, uh, you have to take into account of the geopolitical implication. So, um, my question is, uh, just how much of the IPS uh, is uh, derived because of the threat uh, from China? If there was no uh, Chinese 
economic coercion uh, wouldn't be necessary from Canada to come up with an IPS. Is this a reactive uh, response to what uh, China has, uh, has done in the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy or in, in the Indo-Pacific region? Or is this entirely an original idea from Canada? It is a reactive uh, approach or it is an entirely original approach that you are going to bring the e uh, Canadian economy into a certain shape. So uh, this, this is a big, very big, uh, grand uh, uh, question, but I would really uh, appreciate if I can uh, gather some wisdom from the panel. Thank you. Okay, that's a really good question. And uh, of course, I don't work for global affairs anymore, so I can say whatever I want. Uh, in my view, it's two strategies in one. Um, there has long been a desire on the part of uh, Asia-Pacific uh, proponents, like myself and many others in this room, to expand our presence in the Pacific, to sort of get back uh, to the region, um, to stop this episodic on-again, off-again uh, uh, effort. Um, Coupled with that is the, it's not working at the moment, but the growing awareness of, of, of ties with India, particularly driven by immigration and, and India's role as an emerging economic power and, uh, you know, its, uh, its demographics and so forth. So that's the positive side. As this strategy was being developed, uh, the wheels fell off the bus on Canada-China relations because of Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels and uh, retaliation and uh, hostage diplomacy and so on. And so the government had to deal with that. So uh, it put the two together. And uh, that's, I think, frankly, it's a criticism I've made of the IPS. We talk about... Uh, uh, sort of diversifying away from China and embracing the rest of the region and, uh, and, and working with like-minded partners. The only problem with that is that a lot of people in the region don't want to be co-opted as part of a coalition against China. The ASEAN and the Malaysians and others have made that abundantly clear. So in terms of our announcing, hey, we're back, uh, we have to be very careful that we're not sending the wrong sort of message that you, we're here to uh, help you deal, to, to get you to help us to deal with our China problem. Um, at the same time that we sort of shifted away from China, uh, we also didn't completely cut off China. I think if you read the strategy carefully, there's, uh, there's a recognition we need to continue to deal with China, invest resources in understanding China, and so forth. The price for that seemed to be to um, use some strong language to call China a disruptive power and this and that. So, you know, all the, the decades of uh, uh, friendship and toasting and gambe and yoi and all that kind of stuff uh, was sort of put aside and we sort of we were now going to be clear-eyed, is the term that was used, and call China out for what it is. At the same time, we need to continue to deal with China. We, are, we have a degree of interdependence with the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the sustainability file is, is, is but one of a number where you need to engage with China. So to answer your question, I think it was convenient in a way that it came along at, at the time that it did. It, 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 it put uh, the Canada-China relations in a broader framework and enabled it to... Uh, to, uh, to deal with that issue while being positive in many other ways. I think we just have to be very, very careful in execution that it's not perceived as being, as I mentioned, us trying to co-opt others to deal with our China problem. I would just like to add one small point to that. Um, we did some work at the Mug School on comparative Indo-Pacific strategies. What I found very interesting is when you look at Japan and Korea, they don't even mention the word China in their Indo-Pacific Indo strategy. But certainly, if you look at the American uh, version of it as well, it's, it's much more China-oriented. So it's interesting how Asian countries approach it in a different way. Um, I think we're almost out of time, Bijan, is that correct? So I'd like to first thank uh, Bijan and IPD for inviting us to uh, have a conversation with you. And uh, thank you to all the panelists for such a great discussion.